This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. This episode also contains explicit language. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you once again for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. We are in the series, The Day the Music Died. In these episodes, I relate stories of the tragic endings of musical icons. This is episode 10, chapter 2, Kurt Cobain. Kurt Donald Cobain was born February 20th, 1967 at Grays Harbor Community Hospital in Aberdeen, Washington. He was Don and Wendy Cobain's firstborn child. Don was 21 years old and Wendy was just 19. They doted on the beautiful towhead boy with bright blue eyes and an endless supply of energy. Kurt never stopped moving. He was always in motion. He loved to play sports, draw, and especially loved music. From the time he was a toddler, he was given child-sized play instruments, guitars, drums, and pianos that he delighted in playing and even began to compose simple songs by the time he was four years old. Musicians ran in his family. His Aunt Mary played guitar and his Uncle Chuck was in a band. Kurt loved to go to his uncle's house and play around with his real full-size drum set. Kurt was also close with his paternal grandparents, Leland and Iris Cobain. Leland was a gruff but attentive grandfather who was a woodworker and taught his grandson to work with tools. His grandmother, Iris, passed on her love of art to Kurt. He loved to draw and create with whatever he could get his hands on, and his grandmother encouraged him. His parents bought their home in 1969 when Kurt was two. It was located at 1210 East First Street in Aberdeen. His sister Kimberly was born the following year. While Wendy stayed home and raised the children, Don worked as a gas station mechanic and later got a job in the office at a timber mill. Being the first child and grandchild on either side of the family, Kurt got a lot of attention. He was a beautiful and spirited child and his parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles doted on him. Because he was constantly in motion, they tried to keep him occupied and entertained. He played baseball and his father was very involved in this sport with his son going to his games and helping him practice. Although, at times, it seemed Kurt was more interested in using his bat as a drumstick, banging out rhythms with it on garbage cans and plastic pails in the yard. He did have some sibling rivalry with Kim. Having gotten used to being the center of attention, he sometimes seemed to resent his family's attention to Kim and would pick on her and sometimes hit her. He would get punished and sometimes spanked for this, but at other times, he would play with his little sister and be kind, drawing her pictures and being affectionate. The family took trips together, once in a coveted trip to Disneyland, which was a big deal, but more often sledding and fishing trips in the nearby mountains and lakes. Don and Wendy increasingly argued and fought. There was tension about money because there was never much. Also in the mid-1970s, the feminist movement was really hitting its stride, and many women who were traditionally taught that they should be content as wives and mothers wanted more freedom to express themselves as individuals. Wendy was a beautiful young woman and had probably married before she knew what she really wanted. She loved her kids, but no longer felt she loved Dawn. She was restless and bored in the marriage. She also found mothering Kurt to be increasingly difficult. By all accounts, he was a hyperactive child. They sought a doctor's advice, and when he was in the second grade, he was prescribed Ritalin. He was only on it for three months. Wendy reports that it made him even more hyper, and now aggressive, so they stopped giving him the pills. Kurt remembers the tension and arguments between his parents well. His father didn't want to get divorced, but Wendy said she could no longer live with Don and filed for divorce when Kurt was nine. Wendy kept the family home, and Don at first moved in with his parents. Wendy was still having a hard time disciplining Kurt, and he fought more with his mother. He started to say he wanted to live with his father, and so Kurt moved in with his dad and grandparents. He was spoiled by his father. He purchased a mini bike for him and spent all of his free time with Kurt now. Soon after Kurt came to live with him, Don rented a small apartment, and he and his son lived alone together. They both enjoyed their time together. They would go to dinner together, play sports, and Don said it was a happy time. So happy that Kurt, one day, asked Don to promise not to remarry. Wendy had already begun dating and soon began a relationship with a man named Frank, who Kurt hated. Kurt was also embarrassed because not many people he knew, and especially not his friends, had divorced parents. He was also angry at his mother for dating and going out. Wendy began to drink more and would hang out in bars and clubs. His friends would comment at how hot his mother was, and he would become furious. Even though they were divorced, Don and Wendy still fought. 
about the kids, about child support. There was a lot of bad blood between them, and their fights and negative comments about each other would continue throughout Kurt's life. The divorce stressed out Kurt badly, and he began to have stomach issues. He got sick frequently with stomach pains, and food made him ill. He had to visit his mother, but she and Frank, her new boyfriend, also fought, and Frank was violent. Once, when they were both drinking, Wendy ended up with a broken arm after a fight with Frank. It was an increasingly chaotic time for Kurt, and he became more angry. He began to act out at school, bullying other kids. He was sent to counseling for the first time because of his behavior. Kurt had changed schools after moving with his father. While before he was shy and quiet, he now tried out a new persona at this school. He was now aggressive, loud, but often funny. His blonde hair and piercing blue eyes and good looks garnered him a lot of attention from the girls, and boys wanted to be his friend because of this and because of his humor. For the first time, he was popular. He liked the attention. Don was a traditional guy who always wanted to be a family man. Putting aside his promise to Kurt, he began to date and soon met and married Jenny Westby. She had two children of her own, and now Kurt had to share his dad not only with a new stepmom, but also with a nine-year-old stepsister, Mindy, and a five-year-old stepbrother, James. The new couple soon had another child together. Kurt's half-brother, Chad, was born in 1979. Dawn was also granted legal custody of Kurt that same year. Kurt was a very unhappy child at this time. He had to follow a lot of rules at his dad's house now, and Dawn often sided with his new wife over Kurt's wishes. He felt Jenny's kids got more attention and that he was unfairly punished. Don admits that he often took Jenny's side in these arguments. He didn't want to end up divorced again and tried to keep Jenny happy. Kurt was a difficult child to handle as well. He was a teenager now and was often either moody or angry. He was a typical teen and rebelled at doing chores or even simply keeping himself and his surroundings clean. He visited his mother on weekends to give Don and Jenny a break, but he wasn't happy there because Frank was still around and they didn't get along. Kurt's creative side came out more now, and he constantly was drawing and writing. He also was given a Super 8 video camera as a gift, and now used it to create short films. Kurt's movies and drawings were often focused on dark subjects. Violence, blood, guts, and murder. He often talked and joked about suicide. At age 14, he told a friend who commented that he should become an artist, I'm going to become a superstar musician, kill myself, and go out in a flame of glory. One of his short films was titled, Kurt Commits Bloody Suicide, where he pretended to cut his wrists with a Coke can and used a large amount of fake blood to graphically illustrate his death. While his talk of suicide was disturbing, his family was not that surprised. Suicide seemed to be an ongoing theme in the Cobain family. When Kurt was 12, his grandfather's brother, Burl, committed suicide by shooting himself twice, once in the stomach and once in the head. Just a few years later, another of Leland's brothers would also commit suicide with a gun after the loss of his wife. But most disturbing would have to be when Kurt and his two friends came upon the body of another boy who had killed himself by hanging himself outside of the school. The dead boy was his friend's brother, who, along with Kurt, discovered the body. The boys stared at the body for several minutes before adults were alerted and shooed them away from the gruesome scene. Rather than being upset by this, it seemed to fuel Kurt's obsession with death and other dark subjects, and he increasingly talked, wrote, and drew pictures about these subjects. He joked with friends that he possessed suicide genes. Kurt admits to being depressed and angry as a young teen and began to self-medicate, at first with marijuana. He used it as an escape, escape from the pain and embarrassment over the breakup of his family, over shame, he felt self-conscious, awkward, and often unloved. A pattern throughout Kurt's life was the need to be loved, followed by pushing the limits of what those around him could handle, almost daring them to reject him. This often ended up in Kurt pushing everyone away and becoming even lonelier and more isolated. Kurt began this pattern by his middle school years. He would be lazy, aggressive, rude, destructive, crude, and disrespectful. But other times, he was funny, sweet, and loving. He would pull people into him with his sweet nature, talent, humor, and charm, and then when they were hooked in, he would begin to push them away with his bad behavior. When he was finally rejected, he would feel ashamed and angry and masked his pain increasingly by blotting out his feelings with drugs. He began using marijuana and sometimes LSD in the eighth grade. 
and by the ninth grade, he was smoking weed almost daily. Kurt never did well in school, not because he wasn't bright, he was very intelligent, but because he refused to do homework or engage in class, except art class where he excelled. His art teachers say that they almost never saw a student with more natural talent and imagination than Kurt. But he never stuck to the assigned work and would draw and create whatever he felt like doing. He began cutting school more frequently and saw less of his friends. He began high school in 1981. At first, he tried in school, even trying out for football, track, and wrestling. He quit football when he realized it required too much effort. Although he missed most practices, he did well in track, perhaps due to his small size. He was quick, but also strong enough to throw the discus well enough to place in meets. Wendy believes he only played sports to please his father, and she may be right. Once Kurt became more angry with his father over the situation at home with his stepmother and step-siblings, it seemed he began to throw his wrestling matches, not trying at all, but being pinned easily by his opponents. His father would attend these wrestling meets, and Kurt knew he'd be there to see these humiliating defeats. He soon quit wrestling as well. It seems like everyone in the family was trying to find a way to engage Kurt and get him to apply himself to something. The one thing that finally worked was when his Uncle Chuck told Kurt he could choose either a bicycle or an electric guitar as a gift for his 14th birthday. Kurt chose the guitar. It was a cheap guitar, but Kurt practiced on it incessantly, abandoning everything else, including schoolwork. Fights at home continued between Kurt, Don, and Jenny. It was his idea to leave his father's house in 1982 at the age of 15. He would live in 10 different homes in the next four years, bouncing from one place to the next. At first, he moved in with his grandma, Iris, and Grandpa Leland. And at first, things worked out okay. His grandma was always his biggest supporter and defender, and his grandfather tried to guide him. But true to his pattern, Kurt began testing the limits. Perhaps he was just recreating the father-son dynamic he had with his father, now with his grandfather. He balked at rules and was scolded and criticized by Leland due to his stubbornness and laziness. By that summer, he'd left his grandparents' home and moved in with his uncle Jim, his father's brother in South Aberdeen. Jim was also a musician and Kurt took advantage of access to his equipment and his extensive record collection. He helped his uncle to build an amp and was an eager student. But his uncle was married and recently had a child. Kurt was sleeping in the living room and soon it was determined that there was not enough room for Kurt to stay long term. He bounced in between his maternal aunts and uncles, couch surfing as it were, and then ended up at his Uncle Chuck's. Chuck also encouraged Kurt's musical aspirations, even providing him with a few guitar lessons. His uncle had his band's guitarist tutor Kurt. Kurt was able to trade up from his cheap guitar to a real Ibanez. Kurt then moved in for the first time since the divorce with his mother Wendy. She was no longer dating Frank, but now was dating a 22-year-old. Kurt was mortified and still had to deal with the fact that his high school buddies liked to come over and check out his mom. Kurt went to his first rock concert at the age of 16. Later in life, Kurt would try to reinvent himself by making up stories that fit his cool, nonconformist image. He would report that the first concert he attended was to see the punk rock group Black Flag, but in actuality, it was to see Sammy Hagar. It wasn't until the next year, 1983, that Kurt discovered punk rock. Kurt was also a late bloomer with girls. While girls liked him and flirted openly with him, he seemed clueless and didn't have a girlfriend until late into his teens. His first serious girlfriend, Tracy Miranda, says she gave him every signal that she was interested in him when they first met, but he didn't seem to notice. It wasn't until a friend of hers told him that Tracy liked him did he get it, and he was shocked and surprised. In his junior year in high school, he finally took a chance to ask a girl out. He did it by drawing her a poster-sized version of a picture she had complimented him on, not feeling confident enough that she would respond to him alone. He discovered punk rock and started following bands like the Melvins, who became his idols. It was the summer of 1983. They played faster than I ever imagined music could be played and with more energy than my Iron Maiden records could provide. This is what I was looking for, he would write later. Kurt's appearance began to change at this time. He grew his hair long, almost never washed it, and took to wearing a trench coat and high-top tennis shoes. 
He was getting drunk and stoned with his Aberdeen friends most days. And besides his daily marijuana habit, he was taking acid four to five times a week as well. His mother now had a new boyfriend, Pat O'Connor, who she would eventually marry. Kurt fought with him too. At age 17, Kurt had his first almost sexual encounter. He took a girl back to his house, and before he could be consummated, Wendy arrived home and walked in on Kurt and the girl. Furious, Wendy threw the girl out of the house. Kurt was angry and humiliated. Kurt fought more and more with his mother and especially her boyfriend, Pat. Wendy was planning to marry Pat and didn't want to chance her teenage son ruining this relationship for her. She told him he needed to leave. Kurt had nowhere left to go. He was 17, was close to dropping out of high school altogether, had never held a job, and had burned most of his bridges with family members. He left with a hefty bag full of his things and his guitar. He first stayed with his pal, Dill Crover, but was sleeping at night curled up in an old refrigerator box on his porch. He would tell the story later that he lived under a bridge, but this was pure fiction. The amount of rain Aberdeen got, and as cold as the nights were, he would not have survived long. Although the truth is not much better. Kurt would find an apartment building and sleep in the hallways at night, since they were heated and safer than being on the street. During the days, he would while away the time in the waiting rooms at Grays Harbor Community Hospital, the hospital he was born at 17 years earlier. He could stay as long as he wanted without arousing suspicion, and there were televisions and soft couches. He could sometimes sneak food off of trays in the hospital cafeteria. After four months, out of desperation, Kurt moved back in with his father. At this time, Kurt was aimless, hopeless, sad, and worn out. There was a 15% unemployment rate at the time, and Kurt, a high school dropout with no job skills, was hard-pressed to find work. He considered joining the Navy, which would have been a disaster considering his aversion to rules and authority. But after connecting with an old school friend, Jesse Reed, who was a Christian, he began attending church. He must have found some solace in the church's teachings because he decided to be baptized and even stopped drinking and doing drugs for a time. His conversion, however, was short-lived, and he would go on to be very anti-religion and anti-God the rest of his adult life. He did, however, move in with his friend Jesse Reed, whose father was a Christian youth counselor. He had also been a rock musician for over 20 years. The Reeds lived 14 miles outside of Aberdeen in a 4,000-square-foot house. They had grown attached to Kurt. They thought he was a sweet boy who seemed lost. Kurt and Jesse would play their guitars as loud as they wished all day. The house was large and in a remote area. Kurt would stay with the Reeds longer than anywhere else he had been since he left home. That same year, 1984, Kurt saw the Black Flags perform. He was even more inspired to start a band, for real this time. Kurt and Jesse began to jam with another boy, Chris Novoselic, who they had gone to high school with. Kurt tried to go back to school to work on his high school diploma, enrolling in a continuation high school, but he soon dropped out of that school as well. Instead, he got a part-time job in a restaurant as a dishwasher, busboy, and sometimes prep cook. He was continuing to write songs and play his guitar as much as possible. In February 1985, Kurt turned 18 years old. His mother had married Pat and was now pregnant. That year, she gave birth to his sister, Brianne. While working at the restaurant, Kurt cut his finger badly. Panicked that he wouldn't be able to play his guitar, he quit his job. He then spent all his time isolated at the Reeds, playing his guitar, but also drinking and doing drugs. The Reeds, unable to reach Kurt anymore, kicked him out. Kurt was 18 and back on the streets. He applied for and received $40 in food stamps a month. The unemployment office got him a job at the YMCA. Kurt loved working with kids, and they loved him. He said it was the best job he ever had. But that job assignment ended, and he was then sent to work as a janitor. At the same high school he had dropped out of. The irony was not lost on him. But he was able to rent a studio apartment with his friend, Jesse Reed, for $100 a month. It was a dive, but he had a roof over his head. While drinking and drugging, Kurt continued to cause trouble. While he was a gifted artist, he had no money for art supplies, except spray paint, it seemed, which he used to graffiti the city. He was caught that summer and arrested for vandalism. He was fined $180 and received a suspended 30-day sentence. Jesse announced to Kurt that he was thinking of enlisting in the Navy, 
Kurt, always hypersensitive to being abandoned, kicked Jesse out of the apartment in a preemptive strike before he could be left by his good friend. Unable to keep up with the rent, Kurt was evicted two months later. Kurt then went to stay with his high school friend Steve Schillinger and his family. The Schillingers had six kids and Kurt slept on the couch. In December 1985, Kurt began to rehearse the songs he wrote with Dale Crover on bass and Greg Hokanson on drums. He named this first band Fecal Matter. They recorded some of the songs at his Aunt Mary's house on a reel-to-reel tape recorder. He dubbed copies to hand out, but Fecal Matter broke up without playing a single gig. In May 1986, Kurt was arrested for trespassing. He was climbing the roof of an abandoned building and was intoxicated. He also had an outstanding warrant as he hadn't paid the fine from the vandalism charge. He spent eight days in jail. He'd been staying with the Schillingers for over a year, and he started fighting with Eric Schillinger, Steve's brother. He got into a physical fight with him, and the Schillingers had had enough and kicked him out. This was Kurt's vicious cycle. He created a relationship, form intimacy with others, then create conflict which led to banishment and isolation. It was during times of isolation that Kurt delved deeper into drugs and alcohol. Wendy lent Kurt $200 to rent a house, a shack really, at 1000 one half East 2nd Street, two blocks from her house. Kurt began working as a maintenance man and also traveled as a roadie with the Melvins. He was still practicing his guitar and writing more songs. Besides pot, acid, and beer, Kurt took to huffing aerosol cans when he wanted to get more high and didn't have enough money. His drug use was becoming more extreme with frequent binges. During this time, he talked more frequently about suicide and early death. A neighbor and friend, Ryan Agner, told him, What are you going to do when you're 30? Kurt replied, I'm not worried about what's going to happen when I'm 30, because I'm never going to make it to 30. You know what life is like after 30. I don't want that. He kept trying to form a new band, but none took. Finally, in 1987, he began to perform in an unnamed band with Chris Novoselic on bass and Aaron Burkhard on drums. Kurt played guitar and sang. They played their first gig at a house party in Raymond, Washington. They performed an original song Kurt wrote called Downer. Chris was drunk and Kurt was nervous, but a guest noted that Kurt was worth watching even if only because he seemed so intense. The party descended into chaos, but they played some good songs. Kurt left Aberdeen that year with his girlfriend Tracy, who he'd met that year. They moved into a tiny studio apartment in Olympia. Tracy worked nights and provided for the couple financially. Kurt was unemployed, spending his days writing songs and practicing his guitar. He was charged with doing the housework. He was always a terrible housekeeper, and Tracy would leave lists of chores and errands for Kurt to do each day before she left for work. He also spent time creating art projects and writing in his ever-present journal, a habit he would continue throughout his life. His band, although still unnamed, performed at parties around Olympia, which was a college town, and was asked to perform on a college radio station. They continued to rehearse almost every day. In January 1988, the band drove to Seattle to record a demo tape. They had replaced Burkhardt as drummer with Dale Crover temporarily. They reserved time at Reciprocal Recording Studio for $20 an hour. The band's Mud Honey and Soundgarden had recorded there. The studio was co-run by Jack Endino, who was there on that day. He was impressed, but not overly so. They recorded nine and a half songs in six hours, only not finishing the last song as they didn't want to pay for another hour of studio time. That night, they played all the songs they had just recorded at Tacoma's Community World Theater in front of an audience of 20 people. They were paid $10. They were finally professional musicians. Dale Crover, after leaving back to California, was replaced by Dave Foster on drums. They finally settled on the name Nirvana for the band. Kurt liked the Buddhist concept of one finally transcending the pain and human suffering of life to reach spiritual perfection. And Dino sent their demo tape to a couple of people, and they started to get noticed. They were asked to play a small club in Seattle called The Vogue in April 1988. Jonathan Poneman from Sub Pop Records, an indie label, would be there to see them play. Their performance was far from electrifying, and the audience seemed uninterested. Kurt was upset on the way home and said they sucked and that he vowed to practice nonstop to make the band better. Poneman called two days later and suggested they do a record. Kurt jumped at the offer. 
He also reframed the performance in his mind, later saying how big the crowd was and what a great performance it was that caused the record label to offer them a deal. This was another theme in Kurt's life. He could not handle shame or embarrassment. Whenever he felt ashamed, he had to go through great lengths to distance himself from it. Either he'd numb his feelings about it through drugs and alcohol, pretend it did not affect him, or create a new story that he then most likely believed to be the truth. He also created stories to either garner more sympathy, such as the living under the bridge story, or make himself appear more cool and nonconformist, like the story of his first concert being a punk rock band. He admitted this in a rare moment of self-disclosure when he wrote in his journal, Everything I do is an overly conscious and neurotic attempt at trying to prove to others that I am as at least more intelligent and cool than they think. Nirvana recorded their first single for Sub Pop called Love Buzz. Meanwhile, they had yet another new drummer after Dave Foster beat up the son of the town's mayor and spent two weeks in jail. He was replaced by Chad Channing. The single was released in October 1988. Nirvana was anticipating an album deal with Sub Pop but it looked more unlikely to happen as Sub Pop was having financial issues. The day after Halloween, Nirvana was scheduled to play at an Evergreen State dorm party. Before their set, a fight broke out and the cops were called and began to shut down the party. Partygoers pleaded with police to let the band play first. Cops finally agreed, but told them to be quick. They only had 20 minutes. This was the first time Kurt really showed what he could do. He seemed to be better under pressure, and he came across as confident and gave an intense and memorable performance. Feeling good, he smashed his guitar to pieces at the end of the set. College kids now loved Nirvana and became their biggest supporters and advocates. While Kurt and Nirvana have always claimed in interviews they couldn't care less about fame or record sales, but only wanted to make good music, this was not at all the case, at least not for Kurt. He wanted to be known, and he wanted the attention being a rock star would provide. He'd been seeking the limelight, I believe, ever since he lost the coveted position as most loved child, grandchild, and nephew with his family. Now he was seeking the spotlight again in order, perhaps, to prove that he was worthy of such love. His first act was to take the single and drop it off at the college radio station. He then drove around with his friends all day waiting for them to play it on the air. When they still hadn't several hours later, he called the station anonymously and requested it himself. He was finally able to hear his song played on the radio. That December, Kurt was happier than his friends and family had seen him in a long time. He was still riding high from the dorm show and the release of the single. The band was beginning to be written up in college papers and in The Rocket, an independent newspaper that reported on the music scene in the Pacific Northwest. The reporter, Greg Alden, wrote about them and called Nirvana, too clean for thrash, too pure for metal, too good to ignore. The first pressing of Love Buzz sold out, It was only 1,000 copies, but it made the label excited enough to now give a green light to recording a whole album. Now that Kurt was focused on the album, he began to distance himself from the single, calling it commercialized rock and stupid. He would continue to have a love-hate relationship with all of his work. Nothing the band ever did matched the way it sounded in his head. He was in love with everything he wrote and recorded until it came out, and then he always found something wrong with it. Kurt was never satisfied with his work, with himself, and it seems with life in general. This was also true of his relationships. He was head over heels in love with Tracy and wanted to always be with her. But now that they had been together for a while and Tracy was completely devoted to him, he told her that she shouldn't love him so much. She could feel him distancing himself from her and sometimes would test him and tell him maybe he should move out, figuring he really didn't have anywhere else to go, so he'd reconsider their relationship. He'd just say that he could leave if she wanted. He'd just live in his car. He wouldn't directly say what he felt, but instead wrote a song that was obviously about the relationship even though he said it wasn't, but merely something that came into his head, not about anyone in particular. The band loved the song, and when they asked him, what's it about, he shrugged and said it was about a girl. So that became the title for the song, the first straight love song he'd ever written. Between writing and rehearsing, Kurt was always trying to learn everything he could about the music business. The band still hadn't made any money, for their performances or for record sales beyond a few dollars. Kurt read the book, All You Need to Know About the Music Business, and after reading it, decided they needed a contract. Chris drunkenly showed up at the label owner's house and pounded on the door demanding a contract. Sub Pop drafted a short contract that went into effect January 1st, 1989. 
It called for three albums over three years, and they were to be paid $6,000 for the first year, $12,000 for the second year, and $24,000 for the third. Nirvana's first album, Bleach, was released in June of 1989. They began touring first on the West Coast, with stops in San Francisco and San Jose before heading back up north to Seattle. The band had only done about two dozen shows in two years, and in 1989 they performed over 100 gigs. Some of these shows consisted of only a couple of dozen people, but back in Seattle they had an audience of over 600. The label needed to get them in front of as many audiences as possible, so they began to tour across the U.S., Bleach had become a college radio station staple across the United States, and Sub Pop wanted to capitalize on this. At these shows, Kurt loved the energy of the crowds. His antics became more over the top, smashing instruments and a new concert activity, stage diving into crowds. He loved the energy and the violence of the new fad, slam dancing, and urged the crowd on at Nirvana's shows. He loved using his music to create chaos. He would invariably end the show by diving into the drum kit and smashing it and the drummer to the ground. British journalists, who were paid by the label to come and take in a Nirvana set, wrote glowingly of the band in their trade newspapers. Placing them among other bands who were stars in Britain like Mudhoney, they categorized Nirvana as grunge rock. The term was coined to describe loud, distorted punk music, but came to be synonymous with virtually every band that came out of the Pacific Northwest. Kurt hated the term, but was helpless to stop this label from being firmly fixed to his band and their sound. The tour continued across the U.S. They had no management on the road, so they were on their own. They still didn't have much money, just per diem, a fixed amount to spend each day on hotels, food, and gas. Sometimes, with not enough money, they had to forego food or just have a snack to pay for gas for the day. Kurt had been plagued since he was a child with increasing stomach pain that had never fully been diagnosed or treated. The pain got worse on the road. Whether due to stress or a poor diet or a combination is not known. What is known is that Kurt was more miserable every day. While playing in the southern states like Texas, some shows were virtually empty. Kurt did not get along with their newest drummer, Jason Everman, and they began to have frequent disagreements. Kurt was also not indulging in drinking or smoking and had decreased his drug use markedly. He was trying to preserve his voice, he said. He was also homesick. He missed Washington and Tracy. There was no one to take care of him on the road. By the time they reached New York, Kurt had had enough. He told Novoselic that Jason was fired, and he canceled the rest of the tour. The band drove home from New York in just under three days. No one spoke the whole way. Once home, Kurt saw a doctor about his stomach issues. The doctor recommended a treatment, but Kurt declined. The treatment included injections, and Kurt was afraid of needles. Tracy was convinced his stomach pain was due to his poor diet, mostly junk food and fried fatty food. Kurt hated vegetables and would not eat them. Back home, the band discovered that Bleach was shooting up the charts in the UK. A European tour was planned for the fall. Nirvana first set foot in London on October 20th, 1989. It was called the Heavier Than Heaven Tour, as they were touring with another sub-pop band whose front man was over 300 pounds. They performed 37 shows in 42 days in nine nations. Their road manager said their shows were either phenomenal or kind of atrocious. They still weren't given much money, but they were getting a lot of airplay and Bleach was in the top 10 on the UK charts. Once home, they were still waiting for royalty money and not expecting much, so Chris and Kurt started a janitorial business to pay the bills. Sub Pop sent them on another West Coast tour. While in San Diego, Kurt celebrated his 23rd birthday by connecting with his old friend, Jesse Reed. They went to Tijuana and got drunk and snorted crystal meth together. What seemed to happen was whenever Kurt was focused on writing and recording music, he, although still using drugs, would limit his use. When not writing new music, he would begin to indulge again, and he would start off tours focused, but as he became more unhappy and or sicker on the road, he would begin using substances more heavily. So much so that his tours almost always were canceled before they played their final show. March 1990 found Nirvana on the road once again. He had been fighting more with Tracy and decided to break up with her while on the road. Kurt could never confront conflict face-to-face, and often used passive-aggressive means to end relationships, 
In essence, he found ways through acting distant, aggressive, or like an asshole to get people to reject him. This time, he cheated on Tracy while on tour. Kurt was still pretty clueless when it came to women. They were throwing themselves at him nonstop. He was a front man for a rock band, for goodness sakes. But he had never been unfaithful to Tracy even once before. It was his way to force her hand, and they broke up. The tour fell apart after a month, and they headed home. Because neither he nor Tracy had the funds to move out separately, they both stayed living in the apartment for three months while they were broken up. Kurt met Toby Vale, a musician and founding member of the band Bikini Kill. He fell in love with her, but Toby, being much more experienced, although younger than Kurt, wanted to keep it casual. Kurt was crushed. This was his first real disappointment in love, but they continued to see each other casually. Kurt's songwriting evolved, and he began to find his unique voice when he started diving into topics he was most connected to. Pain, his family, hurt, rejection, shame, and anger. The song Sliver is a song about a boy who was dropped off with his grandparents and who doesn't want his parents to leave. Grandma, take me home, he sings. I don't want to be alone. The song ends as the boy wakes up in his mother's arms. Jenny, Kurt's stepmother, would later say that she believed Kurt had always been so unhappy as a boy because he just wanted to go home to his mom and was unable to. It was also one of Nirvana's first songs to use contrasting dynamics, which had become a signature for the band. Slow and quiet verses, followed by a thundering wall of angry sound. In 1990, Nirvana toured with Sonic Youth and their new drummer, Dave Grohl. They also toured in the UK that year to promote the single Sliver. One of Toby's bandmates, Kathleen Hanna, began dating Grohl. Grohl had moved in with Kurt, and one day, when they were all hanging out at Kurt's, Kathleen spray-painted on the bedroom wall, Kurt smells like teen spirit. Teen spirit was the name of a deodorant that teenage girls wore, and she was teasing him and saying he smelled like Toby's scent. A few months later, Toby broke it off with Kurt. He was devastated. It triggered his feelings of rejection and abandonment, and as was his way, he internalized it, believing that he didn't deserve her, so that's why she left him. He began writing songs that were more dark and angry, with themes of remorse, desperation, and even rape. He wrote Drain You, Lounge Act, and changed the lyrics of an earlier song, Lithium, to reflect his time with Toby. He also wrote a song titled Smells Like Teen Spirit that was obviously about Toby as well, but also incorporated feelings he had about his parents, his boredom with life, and his eternal cynicism. He turned his rage inward and wrote about himself in his journal as bad, faulty, and diseased. Suicide was back as a frequent topic. Kurt had first injected heroin, overcoming his fear of needles, in 1990. He later would say it was to escape heartache and his stomach pain. He told Chris the first time he used heroin. Chris warned him, citing another musician, Andy Wood, who had died of a heroin overdose that March. Kurt promised he wouldn't do it again, but he lied. To keep it secret, he would do it away from home, finding a dealer in Olympia. He and his friend Dylan Carlson would get together to do heroin as well. That fall, Kurt signed a deal with Virgin Publishing for his songs and was paid $3,000, the most he'd ever received in one check. He immediately went to Toys R Us and dropped $1,000 of it on whatever he wanted, including a Nintendo game system and a BB gun. Record labels were also courting the band. In November, Geffen Records offered them a deal for $287,000, the largest advance ever offered a Northwest band. Kurt received $1,000 per month as a retainer. Kurt used to have a firm no-guns policy, calling them barbaric. He now began to collect guns and would go shooting with Dylan. He was finally diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome and given treatment for his stomach pains. In January 1990, while performing at a small club in Portland, he met Courtney Love. As he walked by, Courtney remarked, You look like Dave Perner, comparing him to the lead singer of Soul Asylum. As a response, Kurt grabbed her and wrestled her to the ground playfully, if none too gently. Kurt later said he had no immediate attraction to her. He thought she looked like a classic punk rock chick, and he'd seen plenty of those. Courtney started following Nirvana's career. Later that year, when her friend Jennifer began dating Dave Grohl, she told Grohl that she had a crush on Kurt. When Grohl told her he was single, she sent him a curious gift, a heart-shaped box filled with a tiny porcelain doll, three dried roses, some tiny seashells, and a miniature teacup, and doused it with her perfume. Kurt was intrigued. 
He liked dolls and used doll parts as a medium for his art projects, gluing pieces to canvases and painting them different colors. They would meet again in May 1991 at the Palladium in Los Angeles during an L7 concert. Courtney was now with the band Hole. They connected and she gave him her phone number. He called her at 3 a.m. and he listened to Courtney talk nonstop for almost an hour. At the time, she was still seeing Billy Corgan of the Smashing Pumpkins. He instantly took a liking to this high-energy girl and told a friend, I've met the coolest girl in the world. Nirvana finished recording the album that would be titled Nevermind in June. Even as the band was becoming more successful, Kurt was unable to care for himself. He forgot to pay his bills, went without eating most of the time, he was painfully thin, and he ended up getting evicted from his apartment. A top-selling rock star, Kurt was nevertheless once again living in his car. Nirvana continued to build their audience through touring. Fans waited in anticipation for the latest album to release. The record company was expecting 50,000 albums sold, but would be happy with half that number. They began planning the video for Smells Like Teen Spirit. The pep rally gone horribly wrong was Kurt's idea for the concept. But true to form, Kurt argued violently with the video director, showing up drunk to the filming. But somehow the video got made and is now one of the most recognizable and award-winning videos in MTV's history. As a final irony, Kurt insisted that a janitor be featured cleaning up after the pep rally, wearing almost the exact same uniform that Kurt was made to wear when he worked his brief stint as his alma mater's janitor. Soon after, Nirvana flew to England to play the Reading Festival. They performed for over 70,000 people, and Kurt declared it the greatest moment of his life. Hole was also there, and Kurt left with two girls to try to make Courtney jealous. Kurt seemed to be enjoying this tour more, but still, most nights after their sets descended into chaos with Kurt and the band destroying hotel rooms, trashing dressing rooms, and starting food fights. Courtney didn't cease in trying to get Kurt's attention. He rebuffed all her advances. Back in the U.S., Courtney showed up in Chicago to visit Billy Corgan, but found him with another girl. After a violent fight, she left and then discovered that Nirvana was in town. She made her way to the Metro where they were performing, and after their set, made her way backstage. This time, Kurt was interested. Always being forthcoming with her personal life, she told him the whole story about her and Billy. They left the club together, walking along Lake Michigan, and ended up at a motel. They parted the next day, but communicated by phone and fax, very old school, nonstop from then on. For the first time, Kurt found a girl who he felt he could relate to and who could relate to him. She had also had a troubled upbringing and came from a broken family. She had her own drug problems, including heroin, which she was now trying to kick. She had also spent some time as a stripper and knew the depths of degradation. And they were both trying to escape their lives. She, he sensed, was his equal. Someone who wasn't too good for him, but was very much like him. He felt safe and understood for the first time in a long time, or maybe ever. Heroin had now become a daily addiction for Kurt. He said that since he was always sick due to his stomach illness, nauseous, starving, and in pain, that as long as he felt like a junkie, he might as well be one. He said his heroin addiction was a decision he made. Courtney had a heroin addiction since 1989. Friends told her to stay away from Kurt because her sobriety was so fragile and he was a threat to it. But the first night they were together, he offered her heroin and she accepted. The second night, she said no, that she had a rule to never do it two days in a row. Kurt pouted and pleaded until she gave in. Kurt had to inject her and himself, though. Courtney was averse to injecting herself and could never do it. Courtney knew that choosing Kurt meant choosing drugs, and she made that choice. By Halloween, Nevermind had gone gold, selling half a million records. By the end of November, it had sold over one million copies in the U.S. alone. As a couple, Kurt and Courtney were a force to be reckoned with. While Kurt was passive-aggressive, Courtney was just aggressive. They were both ambitious and very self-protective of one another. A friend, Carrie Montgomery, met Kurt and Courtney in Seattle together there for the first time. You guys are like a natural disaster, she remarked. But, she said, Kurt was probably the only person who loved Courtney totally and completely unconditionally. Kurt's drug use was extremely obvious by this point. He was gaunt, thinner than he'd ever been, with sunken cheeks and scabbed and yellowed skin. Kurt decided he needed to marry Courtney. As he explained, 
Courtney's and my personalities are so volatile that I think if we were to get into a fight, we'd split just like that. Getting married is a bit of extra security. They got engaged in December. In January 1992, Nirvana flew to New York to appear on Saturday Night Live as a musical guest. By this time, Kurt's heroin addiction was serious, and the band saw him increasingly messed up and out of control. The band and crew blamed his increased use on Courtney, but Kurt had been on the path of serious addiction for some time. He didn't want to feel pain, either emotional or physical due to his stomach illness, and he didn't want to go through the pain of withdrawal, so he continued to use. And heroin users have to use increasingly larger amounts of the drug in order to get the same high, and Kurt was no exception. He scored heroin once in New York, but the drug on the East Coast was more powerful than Kurt was used to. Meanwhile, Nevermind was now the number one album on the charts, and while Kurt said he was tired of playing Smells Like Teen Spirit, it was what was requested of them first and foremost in all of their appearances, including the Saturday Night Live appearance. One bright spot on this trip was that Kurt was able to visit New York's famed Museum of Modern Art. It was the first major museum art buff Kurt Cobain had ever visited. He was, of course, recognized by any number of people as he dashed from wing to wing, taking in some of the world's most celebrated artworks. His mood was much improved as he took in the exhibits. On the afternoon of the SNL taping, Kurt shot up heroin that was stronger than he was used to and became so high that he kept falling asleep standing up at the photo shoot. As they showed up at the studio to tape the live show, Kurt was vomiting and spent most of the time before they were scheduled to go on, lying on a couch in the green room. As the band was introduced, Kurt was noticeably pale, but true to form, when his back was up against the wall, he could still pull out a great performance. It wasn't the best version of Smells Like Team Spirit they had ever done, but Kurt's rawness and anger captivated the audience. After their second number, the band trashed their instruments on stage. Kurt speared a speaker with his guitar, while Dave Grohl picked up his drums and threw them off the riser, smashing them onto the stage. Early the next morning, Courtney awoke to find Kurt overdosed on heroin. She revived him, not probably for the first, and certainly not the last time. He was then interviewed for a magazine article eight hours later, as if nothing at all had happened. Just a few days later, Courtney announced to Kurt that she was pregnant. Upon finding out, Kurt was panicked. He knew that they had both been using heroin that entire month before, when the baby was most likely conceived. He felt great shame about it, and they were both concerned whether the baby was healthy. Courtney consulted a specialist in Beverly Hills who confirmed that all seemed to be normal but warned Courtney about the things that could detrimentally affect her pregnancy, including drug and alcohol use. Courtney quickly tapered off heroin and quit drinking. Kurt and Courtney moved to L.A., and Kurt checked into a motel to detox from heroin. He was also supposed to tour Japan, where it was unlikely he could find heroin easily, and if he was caught with it, it would mean serious consequences, including jail time. When he wasn't on heroin, Kurt's stomach pain increased, and so he saw a doctor. The doctor prescribed a pain medicine that helped enormously, but after taking it for a while, he discovered it contained methadone, a synthetic opioid often used to detox users from heroin addiction, but it is often addicting itself. This, in effect, derailed Kurt's detox from heroin use. Kurt and Courtney planned to be married on Valentine's Day, but Kurt's manager had talked him into having her sign a prenuptial agreement, and the document was not yet complete. The prenup would protect Kurt from loss of future earnings. He still had yet to see much in the way of compensation, as he was still waiting for royalties. His tax return for 1991 showed a taxable income of only $27,000. In contrast, Courtney had just signed a deal with her band Hole that gave her an advance of $1 million and a considerable higher royalty rate than Nirvana had. They were married on a beach in Hawaii on February 24, 1992. Kurt wore a pair of blue plaid pajamas, and Courtney wore an antique silk dress that had once belonged to Frances Farmer, a glamorous Hollywood actress of the 1930s and 40s who was a Seattle native. She was well known for being involuntarily committed to a mental institution due to her increasingly bizarre behavior and drunken exploits. She was later diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. When Kurt saw the sonogram of his child, he remarked, Look at that little bean. When the baby was born, they named her Frances Bean Cobain. Kurt said she was named after Frances McKee of the punk rock band The Vaselines, who Kurt said was his favorite songwriter who ever lived. But I've always suspected it was a compromise, and she was also named after Courtney's idol, Frances Farmer. 
Kurt was refusing to schedule any shows and was increasingly isolating himself and continuing his heavy drug use. Courtney pushed his managers to attempt the first formal intervention to pressure Kurt to get clean. Bob Timmons, an addiction specialist who would later go on to some renown as a staff member of Dr. Drew's celebrity rehab show, was called in. His specialty was working with rock stars. He recommended a program at Caesar sinai Hospital, which Kurt agreed to. He was given methadone to kick the heroin habit and soon seemed to be more healthy. They also addressed his health issues. But he left the inpatient program early and refused to attend the outpatient group meetings to help him stay sober. He had only stayed sober about six weeks and soon after was up to a $400 a day heroin habit. Kurt was still refusing to tour and spent time in increasing isolation working on his art. He talked about quitting the music business and dreamed of opening an art gallery. He also spent a good amount of time obsessing about suicide. He talked about it frequently. He also got a bootleg copy of a videotape. R. Bud Dwyer, a former Republican senator for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, had held the position of state treasurer in 1987, and on January 22, 1987, he committed suicide in front of reporters and cameras. Having recently been convicted of bribery, he called a press conference and in front of everyone pulled out a gun, saying, Please, please, leave this room if this will affect you. And warning those who were trying to approach to stop him, placed it into his mouth and pulled the trigger. By 1992, bootleg copies of the footage of Dyer's suicide were available, and Kurt watched his copy obsessively in 1992 and 1993. Nirvana set out on another European tour. The history of the band had them touring almost nonstop to reach more audiences, sell more records, and continue riding the wave of fame that had come so quickly and surprisingly. While touring, Kurt would get sicker. Stress and poor diet added to his stomach pain, and he would take larger amounts of heroin and ride the vicious cycle of increased drug use and withdrawal sickness. He continued to try to get clean, mostly for the sake of his soon-to-be-born child, and on August 4th entered rehab for the fourth time, but he never stayed long, and it didn't work. On August 18, 1992, Frances Bean Cobain was born, a couple of weeks early, but healthy. She was born at Cedar sinai Hospital, where Kurt was housed at the time in a different wing, the chemical dependency wing. He was hooked to IVs now, as he was down to 105 pounds. Vanity Fair had done a story that was set to be published in the next month's edition of the magazine. It had profiled Courtney Love, detailing her drug use and alleging that she had continued to use heroin during her pregnancy. Now, social workers arrived at the hospital to determine if the baby could be in danger under the care of her parents. Kurt was distraught and left the hospital the day after Frances' birth, injected heroin, and came back to the hospital with a 38 caliber pistol. He went to Courtney's room and reminded her of a pledge they'd made. If it seemed for any reason they might lose their baby, they would both commit suicide. Courtney was anxious and upset about the article, but not suicidal. Courtney had to trick Kurt out of the gun, telling him that she would, quote, go first. Once she had the gun, she gave it to one of her band members who was standing nearby, and he took it to dispose of. Kurt, still depressed, got more drugs brought into the hospital and took a large dose of heroin the next day. Once again, he OD'd and a nurse was called, and he was once again revived. After the social worker's visit in the hospital, the county petitioned to take the baby until a safe environment could be proven. Courtney left the hospital but was not allowed to take the baby. Three days later, a nanny was hired, and Frances was allowed to be released to her care. Six days after she was born, a custody hearing was held. Her parents were only allowed to see her if supervised. Kurt was ordered to undergo a 30-day inpatient drug treatment program, and both of them were subjected to random drug tests. Trying to find a solution that would be suitable to the court, Courtney enlisted her half-sister, Jamie Rodriguez, who was declared temporary guardian. She moved next door to the home Curtin and Courtney were renting so that they could have easy access to the baby. The actual care, however, was handled by Jackie Ferry, the hired nanny. Jamie was simply paid to satisfy the court that a family member would be responsible until a final determination of custody was handed down. Kurt left for drug treatment at Exodus, a program in Marina del Rey, on September 2nd to fulfill his obligation to the court. Later that month, Nirvana performed a show at the Seattle Coliseum. His family was in attendance, including his father, Don, whom he hadn't seen in eight years or spoken to in almost two years. The entire original family was there— 
Don, Wendy, Kurt, and Kim, and Courtney was also there with Frances Bean, who they met for the first time. Don sarcastically addressed Wendy as Grandma, which angered her, and the atmosphere, tense already, turned ugly, with Kurt's parents sniping at each other. Kurt ended up yelling and cursing at his father for his disrespect towards Wendy. At the end of the year, Nirvana was touring South America, now doing enormous stadium-sized shows. One of the biggest was held in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. That December, Kurt was even more depressed and suicidal and alternately going through drug withdrawals. They were working on their next album, which Kurt was planning to title, I Hate Myself and I Want to Die, but instead ended up with the title, In Utero. They began recording it in February, and it coincided with Kurt's 26th birthday. The album, which would include some of Nirvana's biggest sellers, including Heart Shaped Box, which was an homage to the first gift he'd received from his wife, and All Apologies, included themes of birth, death, sexuality, disease, and addiction. Francis was seven months old before the state dropped the child custody case and Kurt and Courtney regained legal custody of the baby. Kurt was ecstatic at being a father and loved Francis more than anything in the world, but he still could not stay clean. Courtney, whose sobriety was always tenuous, having drugs around her all the time, also indulged. Their lifestyle was chaotic, and there was no set schedule for the baby or anything else. Jackie Ferry, who had been Francis's nanny since birth, could no longer take the chaos and the hours she was required to work. She still had most of the care of the infant day and night, and she quit. They couldn't keep a nanny who could handle the chaotic schedule, so Courtney hired a manny, a 20-year-old ex-hole roadie named Michael DeWitt, also known as Callie. On May 9th, 911 was called to the Cobain home in Seattle. Kurt had been found unconscious. His mother Wendy and sister Kim were also called. By the time officers arrived, Kurt was conscious and told his family that he'd rather die than have it reported in the paper that he'd OD'd or got arrested. Wendy says that by that time, overdosing for Kurt had become ordinary, just part of the game. Kurt had had a dozen instances of ODs and near-death experiences in 1993 alone. In June, Courtney tried to stage another intervention, but this time Kurt wasn't having it. He screamed at her and everyone in the room, blaming everyone else for his problems. That same month, Courtney called the police. She had begun arguing with Kurt about having loaded guns in the house. The argument descended into a physical fight where they attacked each other, and Kurt was arrested. All the guns and ammunition were seized from the home. Kurt spent three hours in jail and had to pay a fine of $950. The charges were later dropped. It seemed almost better by the family's admission when Kurt was doing drugs. He was impossible and fell into deep depression when he was suffering the pain of withdrawal. But the drugs weren't working as well as they used to, and Kurt was either always sick or in pain. One journal entry from this time illustrates his desperation and need for friendship and acceptance. Friends who I can talk to and hang out and have fun with, just like I've always dreamed of. We could talk about books and politics and vandalize at night. Want to? Huh? Hey, I can't stop pulling my hair out. Please, goddamn, Jesus fucking Christ Almighty, love me, me, me. We could go on a trial basis, please. I just need a reason to smile. I won't smother you. Ah, shit, shit, please, isn't there somebody out there? Somebody, anybody. God, help me, help me, please. I want to be accepted. I have to be accepted. I'll wear any kind of clothes you want. I'm so tired of crying and dreaming. I'm so, so alone. Isn't there anyone out there? Please help me. And finally, in all caps, help me. The irony was that Kurt had more than a few people who loved him and tried to help him. But whenever someone would get close, he would push them away and dive deeper into drugs and isolation. He was his own worst enemy. Almost every interview that year made reference to suicide. He, however, still claimed he wasn't using drugs anymore. In one interview in New York, he claimed to be happy and more optimistic than he'd been in a long time. Twelve hours later, he OD'd again. His publicist found him with a syringe still in his arm. Courtney and Callie rushed in and, like experts, revived him once more. That September, In Utero sold 180,000 copies in its first week and debuted as the number one album. Of course, a tour was expected and Kurt didn't want to do it, but the money was too tempting. His 1993 income after taxes was predicted, conservatively, to be $1.4 million in songwriting royalties 
$200,000 for record sales and an additional $600,000 for concert tickets and merchandise. The In Utero Tour began in the fall of 1993. Kurt became obsessed with the reviews and also paranoid about the media after the horrible fallout from the Vanity Fair article. Francis was now 14 months old and was present for part of the tour. In November, Nirvana was scheduled to play MTV's Unplugged show. The show featured musicians performing unplugged versions of their songs, that is, not electronically amplified. Kurt was sick before the show, whether from nerves withdrawal or a combination of both is debatable. Someone was sent to get him something to help him out, and they were able to get Valium, but by then Kurt had already had his own delivery made. Although very nervous, he played beautifully and sounded great. Some say this was his best performance on stage in his career. Kurt seemed completely drained at the end of the set. He left the stage and the producers asked him to do an encore. He was incensed and he refused. On the way out, Kurt was grumbling and complaining about his performance, saying it wasn't any good and no one liked it. Amy Finnerty, an MTV programmer, told him that everyone loved it but couldn't make him believe it. She finally yelled at him, saying, Kurt, everyone thinks you're Jesus Christ. Most of these people have never had the opportunity to see you that close. They were totally taken with you. He was quiet for a moment, and as he got on the elevator to leave, nudged her, saying, I was really fucking good tonight, wasn't I? It was the only time she'd heard him admit to his own skill. In January 1994, Kurt and Courtney purchased a house at 171 Lake Washington Boulevard in Seattle. They paid $1.1 million for the 7,800-square-foot home. Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, was their next-door neighbor. There was a separate structure in the rear of the house with a garage and a greenhouse above it. Kurt still had his old Valiant. The car he sometimes had to live in because he had no money and no place to go was now parked in the garage of his million-dollar home. Dylan Carlson, Kurt's old friend who still lived in the area, became Kurt's drug connection. Callie was also a drug buddy, and because of his heavy cocaine use, the care of Francis had been taken over by other employees. If Kurt could not get heroin, he would inject cocaine or methamphetamines or sometimes use prescription pills, including Percodan and Valium. The Lollapalooza Festival was being planned, and the promoters wanted Nirvana to headline. Kurt did not want to do it, but the band was pushing for it. Courtney also argued with him about doing it, as she said they needed it to add to their finances. Kurt had two encounters with his family around the same time. One was to visit his grandma Iris in the hospital where she was undergoing surgery, and then he spent some time with his grandfather Leland, taking him to see the new home. He also called Don and spoke with his father for over an hour, talking about Francis and the new house. Before he hung up, they both said, I love you. Nirvana began their European tour for In Utero, slated to do 38 shows in 16 countries in two months. Courtney couldn't travel with him as she was working on her next album. After three shows, Kurt wanted to quit. He seemed worn out and depressed, and he and Courtney fought by phone about his drug use. He told people that being separated from her made him afraid of splitting up with her. He feared and dreaded divorce and what it would do to Francis, recalling how much the divorce of his parents had affected his life, but he felt they were barely hanging on in their relationship. He was also insecure and thought she might cheat on him. He was told if he canceled the tour, he'd be sued. He was only insured if cancellations were caused by illness. Kurt, always paranoid about being caught with drugs outside of the States, instead would use large amounts of legal prescription medications instead. He took tranquilizers and morphine to help combat his painful withdrawals from heroin. In London, he had a doctor who he could call who would prescribe him legal yet very powerful narcotics. Kurt turned 27 while on the road. Kurt and Courtney also spent their second anniversary apart. Kurt became more despondent on the road, being forced to continue the tour. In Germany, he borrowed some cash. Courtney made sure he didn't have access because she knew he'd buy drugs, and he took off to score drugs. Afterwards, he fought on the phone with Courtney. He then called Rosemary Carroll, his attorney and friend, to both him and Courtney, and told her that he was going to seek a divorce. During part of the tour, the Melvins, Kurt's old friends and mentors, were their opening act— he went to talk with his old friend, Buzz Osborne, who knew him before his name was famous and synonymous with Nirvana. He seemed distraught, Buzz recalled, and told him he was going to break up the band, fire his management, and divorce Courtney. I should be doing this solo, he remembered him saying. Buzz was unsure if he meant his music career or his life in general. 
after that show, Kurt canceled the rest of the tour. He was able to get a note from a doctor saying he was too ill to continue, which was probably true. The band flew back to the States, and Kurt headed to Rome to meet up with Courtney and Francis. On March 3, 1994, Kurt arrived earlier at the hotel in Rome. Courtney was delayed and didn't arrive until that evening. Kurt had a romantic evening planned with roses, champagne, and a gift of three carat diamond earrings for his wife. Courtney, exhausted, fell asleep. She awoke at 6 a.m. to find Kurt unconscious on the floor with blood coming out of his nose. He was fully dressed and had a three-page note beside him. Like Hamlet, he wrote, I have to choose between life and death. I'm choosing death. He also said he was sick of touring and felt that Courtney didn't love him anymore. He accused her of cheating on him with Billy Corgan, who he'd always been jealous of. He said he'd rather die than go through another divorce, meaning his parents split. Courtney called for help and he was rushed to the hospital. He had taken 50 to 60 Rohypnol tablets, a controlled substance used for pain that was 10 times the potency of Valium. He still had a pulse and had a stomach pumped, but he was in a coma. The doctor said he might recover, have brain damage, or die. His family was called with the news. The U.S. media got wind of this hospitalization and mistakenly reported that Kurt Cobain had died. 20 hours later, he emerged from his coma. He was unable to talk. He had tubes in his nose and throat. Courtney gave him a pen and a paper to write out a message. He wrote, Fuck you. Kurt flew back to Seattle on March 8th. It was reported that he had an accidental overdose due to mixing prescription drugs and alcohol. The fact of the number of pills or the note was not released. Once back, the promoters of Lollapalooza were still asking Kurt to commit to perform at the festival. They now offered $8 million in revenue for Nirvana. He was still refusing, and Courtney was also pressuring him to agree. Courtney tried to impede Kurt's drug use by insisting that no drugs could be done inside the house. Kurt took to renting rooms at seedy motels by the highway to shoot up. Courtney gave up trying to enforce this rule, afraid he would OD while alone. By by mid-March, Nirvana was all but broken up. Kurt had canceled the rest of the tour permanently, turned down Lollapalooza, and refused to attend band rehearsals. On March 12th, 911 was called from the Cobain house again. Courtney answered the door, apologizing, and said that there had been a fight between husband and wife, but it was now over. Kurt was called outside, and he told the officers that there was a lot of stress in the marriage. They advised him to seek counseling before it got worse. On March 18th, Kurt threatened suicide again, locking himself in the bedroom with a gun. After some time, he finally let a pleading Courtney in, and she saw that he had several guns on the floor. Enraged and maybe intoxicated herself, She put a gun to her own head, saying, I can't see you die again, in reference to the incident in Rome. Kurt lunged at her for the gun, screaming that there was no safety on it. He grabbed it and locked himself in the room again. Once again, 911 was called. When the police arrived, Kurt told them that he was not suicidal. He was just locked in the room to keep away from Courtney. The police seized the guns again, some of the same guns they had seized before, and had been returned to him after the domestic violence charges were dropped. They also seized some clonopin found in his possession. Kurt had been taking large amounts of tranquilizers, which made him paranoid, manic, and delusional. The police took Kurt in, but didn't book him. About this time, Kurt had also started buying a mixture of heroin and cocaine, or speedballs. Kurt stayed away from the Lake Washington house, wanting to take drugs unimpeded. He would either be at Dylan's or at Kelly's girlfriend, Jennifer's apartment. Jennifer, a seasoned drug user and Kurt's supplier, was amazed at the amount of heroin Kurt would shoot up. She was now afraid that he would OD in her place. He told her not to worry that he wouldn't OD. He said he was going to shoot himself in the head. That's how I'm going to die, he told her. Kurt was so out of control that those around him felt increasingly hopeless to help him, and many dropped out of his life. He was now estranged from almost all of his relationships. He had succeeded in accomplishing what he most feared and dreaded, rejection and abandonment. His friends and family staged one last attempt at intervention on Friday, March 25th. Kurt was called to the house, and when he arrived, everyone was gathered. Courtney, his managers from Golden Mountain and from the record label, Kelly, and a drug counselor, among others. One by one, each person urged Kurt to go to treatment, giving a consequence if he refused. His manager said they would no longer work with him. The label rep said they would drop Nirvana. 
Pat Smear from the band said Nirvana would break up, and Courtney said she would divorce him. She also made a threat she knew would hurt the most. If they divorced and he continued with his addiction, she would limit his access to his daughter. Kurt glared at all of them and lashed out, Who the fuck are all of you to tell me this? He then threw accusations back at them, describing in detail how he had witnessed their own drug usage. He especially laid into Courtney, saying that she was more screwed up than he was. Courtney announced that she was leaving to rehab that night and asked him to join her. He refused. She was then helped to a car and drove away. I didn't even kiss or get to say goodbye to my husband, she would say. It was the last time she would see him alive. Kurt then went to his dealers complaining that his friends were not there for him, that they were all against him. Now alone, Kurt went on a drug binge. First, he went to an apartment and was shooting up with other heroin users. He did so much that he immediately began to OD. Afraid the police would be called, they tried to get him to leave. When he couldn't walk on his own, they dragged him outside and put him in the back seat of his car, his old Valiant, as Courtney had slashed the tires of the other cars so he couldn't flee the intervention. The only reason the Valiant was spared was because she didn't think it was even operable in its condition. Now losing consciousness in the back of his car, the druggies asked him if he wanted them to call 911. He refused. Somehow he survived and made his way home. When he returned, there was a message on his answering machine from a psychiatrist who was trying to reach out to offer him help. Kurt, perhaps realizing that he had reached rock bottom, talked to him for some time. Afterwards, he called Rosemary Carroll and said he'd tried treatment one more time. He booked a flight to Los Angeles that Tuesday. Chris Novoselic drove him, but Kurt had changed his mind. On the way to the airport, Kurt tried to jump out of the car. Chris was able to close the door before he tumbled out onto the highway. Chris dragged him into the airport and Kurt punched him. They both wrestled on the airport floor before Kurt got free and took off running out of the airport. Kurt called the psychiatrist that night and also spoke to Courtney. They had a pleasant conversation and he agreed to fly out the next day. Before leaving, Kurt called Dylan and asked him to help him purchase a gun. His had all been taken by the police and he said he was afraid of prowlers and because he needed the protection. Dylan took him and, in his name, purchased a Remington 20-gauge shotgun and a box of shells. Kurt injected heroin that night before the car came to take him to the airport. Kurt checked into the Exodus Recovery Center on March 30th for a 28-day program. Courtney was staying at the Peninsula Hotel in Beverly Hills at what she described was an outpatient detox program. He denied that he was addicted to heroin, and since no one had been informed that the Rome overdose had been a suicide attempt, he was not locked down in the psychiatric unit but was in an unlocked detox program. That night, Courtney called Exodus, but was told she was unable to talk to Kurt. She cursed at the staff and demanded to speak with him, which may be why they didn't allow her to do so the several other times she also tried to reach him. The next day, Thursday, Jackie Ferry visited Kurt and brought Francis, who was now 19 months old. While he seemed delighted to spend time with his daughter, Jackie says that he seemed out of it, wiped out and sick. He spoke with Jackie about his fight with Courtney over refusing Lollapalooza. When she came back Friday to see him, she said she was surprised to see him looking so good. He seemed rested, happy, and positive. Courtney sent a friend to visit Kurt and bring him some candy that day. He said he was also surprised at how good he looked. Also on Friday, Courtney was finally able to reach Kurt by phone. He told her, no matter what happens, I want you to know you made a really good album. What do you mean, she asked. Just remember, no matter what, I love you. That evening, Kurt climbed over the back wall, even though he was free and able to leave any time, and left Exodus. Kurt purchased a first-class ticket back to Seattle with his credit card. He tried to call Courtney, but didn't reach her and left a message. Meanwhile, Courtney said she was out searching for him. When she heard he'd left treatment, she was afraid he'd gone to score drugs and would OD. She had someone call a reporter to put a rumor out that she had OD'd, hoping, she said, to lure him to her. Kurt arrived back home at 1.45 a.m. on Saturday, April 2nd. Callie and another girlfriend named Jessica were asleep in the house. No one is sure where he was or what he was doing from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., but he woke up Callie, who was asleep, by sitting on the edge of the bed and talking to him. Callie was drugged and groggy and his girlfriend was sick, so they were half asleep during Kurt's visit. Later, Kelly would say that he thought he had dreamed Kurt's visit and so thought nothing of it when he woke later. 
Again, Kurt tried to call Courtney, but there was no answer at the hotel. Kurt was seen around town the next two days, once at a restaurant eating with his dealer and another person. When presented with the check, his credit card was declined. Courtney had canceled it, afraid he used it to get cash to purchase drugs. In hindsight, if he'd had the credit card to use, the bank could have tracked his movements during this time. That Sunday was Easter Sunday. Courtney called a private investigator to help find Kurt. The only person she could reach that day was Tom Grant. He met her at the hotel, and she hired him to find Kurt. I'll go into more detail about his investigation in a bit. Back in Seattle, Kurt was missing. On Monday, Jessica, still laid up in bed sick, thought she'd heard footsteps upstairs. Kelly was gone, and she was too ill to investigate. On Wednesday, she was still ill, but well enough to get up and leave the house. Courtney had been calling the house, but didn't reach anyone. Kelly was afraid to answer the phone, since Courtney was known to yell and berate him. Kurt, it is believed, wrote letters to both Courtney and Francis while he was at Exodus. He placed these letters under the pillows in the master bedroom in the Lake Washington house. I don't know where I'm going, it said. I just can't be here anymore. Now he wrote a letter dressed to Bada, the name of his childhood imaginary friend. In part, it said he was no longer excited about creating music anymore and felt guilty about that. He said he'd tried to do everything in his power to appreciate the applause and admiration, but, quote, it's not enough. He then wrote, I'm too sensitive. I need to be slightly numb in order to regain the enthusiasm I once had as a child. He said he had too much empathy and that he loved people too much. So much, he said, that it makes me feel too fucking sad. He wrote, I have a daughter who reminds me too much of what I used to be, full of love and joy, kissing every person she meets because everyone is good and will do her no harm. And that terrifies me to the point that I can barely function. I don't have the passion anymore, and so remember, it's better to burn out than to fade away. He took this letter upstairs over the garage to the greenhouse. He placed it on a container of potting soil and stabbed the pen through the middle of it so it would be easily found. Sitting on the floor, he injected a large quantity of black tar heroin, placed the rifle against the roof of his mouth, and fired. Kurt Cobain died instantly. He was 27. Kurt's body lay in the upstairs room over the garage without being discovered until that Friday, April 8th, when an electrician hired to install a security system looked through the glass door and saw a body. At first, he thought it was a mannequin. He called the police and then his dispatcher. The dispatcher shared the news of a body found on Kurt Cobain's property with a friend, and the friend called a radio station with the news. Some of Kurt's family and friends, including his sister Kim, heard the report on the radio before being contacted by anyone. Courtney had checked into the Exodus Recovery Center Thursday evening after being arrested at the hotel. Someone had reported that there was drug use going on in Courtney Love's room, and most report that she was using drugs during the, her entire in-house detox at the Peninsula Hotel. She was arrested. Although no drugs were found, she was found in possession of a syringe and a prescription pad. Instead of being booked into jail, she was allowed to check into rehab. Rosemary Carroll arrived on Friday to break the news about Kurt's death. Courtney was inconsolable. She embarked on a drug binge. Seattle police investigators spent 40 days and 200 hours interviewing Kurt's family and friends. It was ruled a suicide, a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. A public candlelight vigil for Kurt Cobain was held that Sunday at Seattle Center's Flag Pavilion. 7,000 people attended. Courtney recorded a reading of the suicide note that was played. It was a macabre message with portions from Kurt's note, broken by commentary by Courtney, calling him an asshole and encouraging the fans at the memorial to call out asshole as well. A private memorial was held at the Unity Church of Truth. Kurt's family and friends, including his first girlfriend Tracy, attended. Courtney was there with Francis, but Grandma Iris couldn't be there. She was too ill to attend. Kurt Cobain was cremated and his ashes kept by his family. In 1999, Kurt's mother, Wendy, had a final service for her son. Kurt's ashes were scattered behind her house in a creek in Olympia, Washington. But stars that burn as brightly as Kurt Cobain don't die out that easily. 
It's hard for the public to accept that someone that young with that much talent could be gone just like that. Myths tend to be created around their life, and especially their death. And when some questions go unanswered, this fuels the fire, and sometimes the conspiracy theories. If you'll recall, Courtney Love hired a private detective on Easter Sunday to find Kurt Cobain after he left the rehab program. Five days later, he would be found dead without the detective Tom Grant ever making contact with him. From the beginning, Grant says he was suspicious of Courtney and her motives, so much so that he came up with an alternative theory about Kurt's death and has spent over 20 years trying to prove it. In 2015, a documentary based on Tom Grant's account of Kurt Cobain's last days and his investigation into his death was released. Titled Soaked in Bleach, the documentary was released in theaters in June and then on video two months later. Tom Grant lays out what he believes is evidence to point to not suicide, but murder. And he further alleges that Courtney Love and Michael Kelly DeWitt were involved in a conspiracy to have Kurt killed. When the film was released, Courtney's attorney filed a cease and desist letter threatening to sue the filmmakers for accusing her of a criminal act without cause. The movie continues to be available, and a lawsuit was never filed. The documentary is very compelling, taken at face value. Using audio tapes that Tom Grant made of his calls and meetings with Courtney Love, Rosemary Carroll, Dylan Carlson, and others, he lays out his case, and actors are used to betray all the characters. If you haven't watched it, you might want to do so before listening to the rest of this podcast but I will lay out the main points the film makes and why some are now convinced that Kurt may have been murdered. Tom Grant said he was immediately suspicious of Courtney. He felt she was all over the place and didn't make sense. She hired him to find her husband, but didn't want him to go certain places, like Seattle, to look for him. She kept changing what she wanted him to do, and he said it wasn't logical. He also disliked her. He makes no bones about that. Truth is, a lot of people disliked Courtney. She could be aggressive, pushy, self-centered, and mean. You will find accounts then and now of people who think she's a train wreck and a horrible person. I didn't do a profile on Courtney Love except in her relationship to Kurt Cobain, so I can't add to this view of her. What I can say is that she was drugged out during this entire time. Tom Grant says that she had her drug dealer at the hotel where she was supposed to be detoxing from heroin and was doing drugs or high every time he saw her. So, was she trying to be evasive and manipulative with a detective? Or was she just so messed up on drugs that she didn't make sense from one sentence to another? The motive Grant outlines is that Courtney wanted Kurt's money, and he was divorcing her, so she risked losing out on Kurt's earnings forever. Kurt did tell his and Courtney's friend and attorney, Rosemary Carroll, according to her, that he was going to divorce Courtney. But there is no evidence that he did anything to start divorce proceedings. Perhaps he didn't get the chance, or perhaps, as we know, Kurt and Courtney had a very volatile relationship, one with so many arguments, fights, and threats, that the police were called more than once, resulting in his arrest one time. So, was he really on the verge of divorcing Courtney? Or, as he'd said before, the last thing he wanted was to subject his child to a divorce. Maybe it was just another angry threat, but we can't know for sure. And one more point. If Courtney was so set on having Kurt die instead of divorce her, why not just let him die any number of times he overdosed? According to several witnesses, Courtney and Callie, the two people Grant alleges wanted him dead, revived him many times, saving his life. While Courtney did gain financially from Kurt's estate, she had to fight for it due to the prenuptial agreement that she signed in 1992 before they were married. It is reported by several sources that Francis Bean was supposed to receive the bulk of his estate upon his death. Courtney was able to sue for and receive the proceeds to his writing and publishing rights. But most make it seem as if Courtney was solely relying on Kurt's fame and money, and that was of tantamount importance to her. Did Courtney want to be married to a rock star? It seems so. She dogged no more than a few up-and-coming rockers in her day before she finally met and married Kurt. Many people, including his bandmates, didn't like her. They saw her as a gold digger and a leech. But what is left out is that Courtney Love was a success in her own right. At Kurt's death, she was just about to release her second album. Her first album was highly regarded by critics and sold well. And as I stated earlier, she had a more lucrative deal with her label than Kurt had with his. That second album, Live Through This, was named Album of the Year by Spin Magazine, and the band Hole is cited as one of the most commercially successful female-fronted rock bands ever.
They have sold over 3 million records in the U.S. alone. It's common for females who are ambitious and aggressive to be considered negatively. I think this is partially why people don't like Courtney. I kind of see her as an annoying personality. The drug use didn't help, and she could be violent and mean and threatening to people who got in the way of her ambition. So I guess I'm saying I'm not a fan of her personality-wise, but you have to give her credit for her success. Perhaps she didn't have Nirvana money if Kurt wasn't in her life, but she was already successful before Kurt's death and went on to have a successful recording and acting career. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, Courtney was also an actress even before she met Kurt. When he first met her, he recognized her for a role in a B-movie he had seen a couple years earlier. So I don't think you can say she was completely financially dependent on Kurt. Grant is also suspicious of the suicide note Kurt left. He reads it not as a suicide note, but as a note to his fans to break the news of his quitting the music business. The first part of the note is all about his dissatisfaction with the music business, how he finds no joy in it and feels guilty for it. Grant thinks that the last few lines of the note, which do read like a suicide note, saying, Please keep going, Courtney, for Frances, for her life, which will be so much happier without me, looks like it was added and is not Kurt's writing. But there are sections of the first part of the letter that no one disputes Kurt wrote that may give clues that he was saying a final goodbye. First, he addresses the letter not to fans or even Courtney or Frances, but to Bada, which was the name of his childhood imaginary friend. This makes it more personal and speaks to his life experiences and not just his musical career. He writes more than once about having too much empathy and loving people too much. I believe what he is stating and what was evident throughout his short life was that Kurt felt things very deeply, more deeply than most, and it tormented him. He was very sensitive to emotions like shame, guilt, and loneliness, and he would turn these strong emotions inward in self-destructive behaviors. He also talks about not being able to handle life anymore in his statements about seeing how his daughter is so innocent and trusting and loving, the way he used to be as a child, and how that terrifies me to the point where I can barely function, and how he can't stand the thought of Francis becoming the miserable, self-destructive death rocker that I've become. I believe he thought his being around would taint her life and cause her to become like him. Finally, he says, it's better to burn out than to fade away. It's also worthwhile to remember how many times Kurt talked about suicide. He'd been obsessed with the subject since he was a teen and even told people that it would be by shooting himself in the head. No one wanted to believe he was really serious, but it's hard to believe someone could talk and write about suicide so much and for so long without it being a real possibility in their mind. But one of the most compelling parts of Tom Grant's theory is how Kurt died. He injected a large dose of heroin before shooting himself, and the detective doesn't believe that this is possible. Others have bought into this theory as well. They believe that a dose of heroin that large, even for Kurt, who was a heavy heroin user, would be instantly fatal and would render him incapable of pulling the trigger. I wasn't sure what to think about this. It seemed like he might be onto something here. So I had a conversation with Justin Evans of the Generation Y and the Peripheral Podcasts, who'd also covered the case and watched Soaked in Bleach. And here's what he had to say. The guy said that Kurt Cobain was holding the shotgun and pulled the trigger, and you know that the shotgun was upside down because of the way the shell ejected. And then, because the shotgun was top-heavy, it flipped over, and Kurt fell back. Now, Soaked in Bleach says a cadaveric spasm happens, and you grip down when you die. But he doesn't take into account that Kurt had a lethal dose of heroin, which, what does heroin do? Ah, that that makes your muscles not do anything. Secondly, sadly, I went and watched about 20 videos of people shooting themselves in the head. And as they die, their hand falls down and the gun slips out of their hands. Where's the cadaveric spasm? Where's this death grip? You know, it's not happening every time. I'm sure it does happen. I'm sure rigor mortis sets in. But it doesn't happen consistently every single time. And so... For him to base his literal entire theory off of it, this shotgun shouldn't have spun around because Kurt would have gripped down on it. It was a semi-auto 20 gauge, and um, and it ejected the shell. And it, the way it ejected it, people questioned because the ejection port was facing the other way, and the shell was over here. And they're like, well, it must have bounced off the wall when it wouldn't have bounced that far. All the reports of his suicide attempts 
were were what really were the tipping point for me to say he probably killed himself. This probably wasn't murder. I think Justin makes some really good points and really gives us another point of view to consider. And by the way, if you haven't discovered the Generation Y podcast, I highly recommend you do. Justin and Aaron always have a way of looking at a case from all sides and giving their listeners even more to think about. But I urge you to consider all the facts and come to your own conclusions. In the meantime, here's a scenario I came up with after all the research I did, reading several books and watching documentaries on Kurt Cobain. You can find links to some of these resources at the website truecrimepodcast.com or on the iTunes page. Just click on the episode artwork to find it. I believe that Kurt had a hard time coping with life. He felt things too deeply, and it affected him greatly. His constant stomach pain was just another thing that caused him to take ever-increasing doses of drugs. And his stomach pain was very real. The common knowledge now is that Kurt probably had Crohn's disease, which is a serious autoimmune disease where inflammation in the GI tract causes extreme stomach pain. I've had a similar illness, and I can attest that it not only causes extreme pain, if untreated to the point of barely being able to function. It also causes your body to be unable to absorb nutrients, so in effect you are slowly starving to death. And 20 years ago, it was often misdiagnosed, if diagnosed at all, and very difficult to treat. Thankfully, today, it can be successfully treated if not completely cured. So, his extreme thinness and constant pain, nausea, and general feeling of misery were also cause for depression. Kurt bounced between deep bouts of depression and hyperactivity. When he was depressed, he could barely function and would binge on drugs, increasing the dosage and potency until it became ordinary, as his mother said, to overdose. When he was not depressed, he went through a manic phase, not sleeping, not eating much, but creating nonstop. He played his guitar, wrote songs, did artwork, and wrote in his journal for hours and even days. Reading his journals, you can see how his mind raced from subject to subject and often went to obsessive subjects that he would write about over and over. Suicide was one, loneliness was another, and birth and death were a constant theme. It's possible that Kurt had bipolar disorder that was undiagnosed. This causes extreme swings in mood, at times deeply depressed, and at other times in a manic phase of extreme activity and even hyperactivity. When we assess for suicidality, we ask a couple of important questions. First, if the person has ever considered suicide. For Kurt, this was a very clear yes. Second, if they have a plan, in what way would they kill themselves, etc. And Kurt always seemed to think if he did kill himself, it would be with a gun. We also find out if they have a way to carry out the plan, if they have a gun or have secured enough pills, etc. I think that Kurt securing the last gun he would need a few days before his suicide points to planning and wanting to have what he needed to carry out this plan. So my theory, for what it's worth, is this. Kurt, feeling at his lowest and really not feeling like he could go on, decided to put his plan into place. I think he might have known that he could not quit drugs, felt ashamed of this, and also knew it was causing a serious problem in his marriage, and he had always been averse to divorce due to how his parents' divorce affected him. He had been so close to dying of an overdose that he didn't want to take a chance to be revived yet again. Just the weekend before, he had done such a large dose that those he was with thought for sure he would die and put him in his car to die alone. But he didn't. So he planned to kill himself a couple of ways. The heroin might have done the job alone, but it could also be used to numb his psychic pain enough to carry out his plan. So he had the gun ready as well. Something I didn't see talked about anywhere, but jumped out at me, was Kurt's mood in the days leading up to his death. When he was visited by friends at the rehab program on Wednesday, He looked terrible and was what you would expect to see from someone who was starting to detox from heavy drug use. But on Thursday, the day before he left the center, his visitors noticed him looking much better. They were amazed at how good he looked. For one thing, if he looked so normal, it's probable that he had did some drugs that day. If he hadn't, he would have been very sick. Secondly, what we know about people who make a final decision to end their lives and are getting ready to carry out the plan is that their mood seems to be better. They feel that they can see the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, and they feel some sense of relief. Those that saw him that day say he seemed happier and more optimistic than they had seen him in quite a while. It's possible he felt a great relief knowing that his pain would soon come to an end. It was a sad and tragic end for a short and promising life, 
His family, friends, and the people who are touched by his music only wish he could have been helped and things hadn't ended this way. Perhaps Kurt felt his suffering would end, but as we know, those who are left behind after his suicide hold on to the pain of the loss forever. Thanks for listening to this episode of Once Upon a Crime. I want to give a special thank you to my guest commentator, Justin Evans. You can find his two great podcasts, Generation Y and The Peripheral, on iTunes. I highly recommend them. I also want to thank all of you, the listeners. I have been overwhelmed by your interest, your wonderful feedback, and your encouragement for the podcast. It's been amazing, and I so appreciate it. Last month, we hit over 100,000 downloads after just over a month of launching the show, and we're well on our way to doubling the listenership this month. Thank you all for listening and sharing the podcast with others. We totally couldn't do it without you. To give feedback or suggest show topics, you can find me on Twitter at Upon a Crime and on Facebook at Once Upon a Crime Pod. Our webpage is truecrimepodcast.com, and we now have a phone number for those of you who'd like to give us a call. It's 408 408- 909 true that's 408 909 8783 thanks again and until next time be good to one another